I hope you are all well tonight. Um, so last week we read from the book, The Heart of Buddhist Teaching by Thich Nhat Hanh. And we read a chapter on right thinking. And in that chapter, he talked about uh, two parts of right thinking. He talked about initial thought and developing thought, where initial thought is the a thought that is noticed and then developing thought is sort of the, the story that comes after it. And he also spoke of four aspects of working with right thinking. And uh, one of those is asking the question, are you sure or am I sure? One is, what am I doing? One is a section he titled, Hello, Habit Energy. So noticing habits of thought or habits of mind. And then the last one was bodhicitta. So arousing that altruistic wish. And the main thing there was transformation from unwholesomeness to wholesomeness. And that little statement is like a main key in Buddhism, just this transformation of unwholesome, unskillful states, patterns, um, intentions, actions into something that is wholesome, that is nurturing, that is skillful. Um, and in a way, it's a path of healing. Right thinking is also sometimes referred to um, as right intention. And I want to read to you uh, the first paragraph of um, a book called The Noble Eightfold Path, Way to End Suffering by Bhikkhu Bodhi. So this is a different author from a different Buddhist tradition but also speaking on this second noble truth of the eight. And in this case, the, the title isn't translated as right thought, it's translated as right intention, but it's still coming from the Sama Sankapa. So that was the, the uh, Sanskrit word, or in Bhikkhu Bodhi's case, the Pali term that he's using. It's translating as right intention. And so this first paragraph of a chapter on right intention is, the second factor of the path is called in Pali, Sama Sankapa, which we will translate as right intention. The term is sometimes translated as right thought, a rendering that can be accepted if we add the provisio that in the present context, the word thought refers specifically to the purposive or cognitive aspect of mental activity the cognitive aspect being covered by the first factor, right view. It would be artificial, however, to insist too strongly on the division between these two functions. From the Buddhist perspective, the cognitive and purposive sides of the mind do not remain isolated in separate compartments, but intertwine and interact in close correlation. Emotional predilections influence views and views determine predilection. Thus, a penetrating view of the nature of existence, gained through deep reflection and validated through investigation, brings with it a restructuring of values, which sets the mind moving towards goals commensurate with the new vision. The application of mind needed to achieve these goals is what is meant by right intention. And in a way, what he is saying and what Thich Nhat Hanh is saying are not different things. But I like this aspect of pulling out the different translation of right intention and the way that Bhikkhu Bodhi is talking about the way right intention and right view are not necessarily separate things, that they influence, it, influence each other and shape each other. Um, sometimes in Zen practice, we talk about changing our past. And in a way, there's a way in which as we resolve old hurts and old karma, we change our relationship to our past and that in itself changes our past.
So this becomes important because not the changing our past part, but the, the looking at Thich Nhat Hanh's words and looking at Bhikkhu's Bodhi's words becomes important um, in that sometimes it's very useful to look at different explanations for things and to look at different, the way different teachers present Dharma. It's easy to read one explanation and say, okay, this is it, I understand it. Or read something else and say, oh, they're wrong because that's a different explanation. But if we can hold a little bit of an ambiguous space that allows for a refinement of understanding, we read one author, okay, I get it. We read another author, oh, that's a slightly different view. How can those two views be mutually supporting if, if and when they don't necessarily describe each thing directly or the same way? There's a, a way that our understanding can deepen by inviting in more, more views, more ideas, more thoughts. I gave a talk at Dharma Rain on Sunday on um, a topic that was suggested to me by one of the chaplains I work with in the hospital. And I knew I was going to have to give a talk and I was like, what do I talk about? What do I talk about? What do I want to talk about? Like, so I, I went up to this chaplain who's also Buddhist and I said, ah, what should I talk about on Sunday? I got to give a talk. And he had been standing there with his mask, with his face shield. I had my mask and my face shield. Everybody's in masks and face shields. And he had gloves on and he just stopped and looked down at his hands and he said the Dharma, Dharma is PPE. So Dharma is personal protective equipment. And, you know, we realized we were late for a meeting so I never got a chance to ask him like, what do you, like, what does that mean for you? Like, what are you, what's interesting there? So I was just left with, okay, uh, Dharma is PPE. Said, okay, I'll roll with it. We'll explore this. Let's see what happens. And so I gave this talk on Sunday um, that was less of a, I'm the teacher giving a talk about this thing that you are to learn about. And it was more of, this is an interesting idea. Let's explore it. Here's my take on it. What do you guys think? So it was very open-ended. And as soon as I got to the question and comments part, right away, somebody present said, well, what you're talking about sounds like refuge. And this is a fundamental aspect of Buddhism is this aspect of taking refuge. And my response was just, I deliberately did not use the word refuge because it's, it's a common term in Buddhism and we all think we know what it is and we all have a slightly different idea of what it is and when you look at something using an entirely different metaphor, something happens. So as people were asking questions and as people were sharing comments, a lot of what I realized was happening was that people were, one, they were excited about this because it gave them a fresh way of grappling with a concept. Dharma as protective, Dharma as personal protective, like what does that mean and how does that work in my practice and like what do I think about that and um, I was so I was so delighted that people were like thinking about this and grappling with it and what does this mean. At the very end as we were running out of time the last person who offered a comment said you know I think about it like this and it and it really blah, 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 blah. And I was like, you know what? You're thinking about that in a very different way than I did, but it's useful for your understanding of how your practice works. And that is perfect. And so we don't even have to agree on what this metaphor means or what it could mean to make it useful. I was looking at it one way and that was the way it made sense for me. And he was looking at it from a different view, applying it to an entirely different aspect of practice than I was talking about. But it 
let him see a part of how he related to his practice that he hadn't seen before. I think that's amazing. I love that. I love when that happens. I love when that happens. So why am I saying this? One of the fundamental teachings of Buddhism is that um, everything is marked by suffering. And yet the arising of that suffering comes from clinging, craving, uh, tanha, thirst. But underneath that clinging and craving, or at the root of that clinging or craving, is a fundamental ignorance or a fundamental delusion. And it has, it's a delusion about the nature of reality, the nature of ourselves, the nature of what all of this is. And so much of the path, much of the teachings, much of the philosophy is all rooted towards gaining that clarity. Gaining that clarity to see through our delusions, to see things as they are, or to see the true nature of. Um, there's a lot of ways this gets presented or, or spun. Next week we'll have this retreat of Rohatsu. For our Sangha, it will be a night of just sitting. And for Dharma Rain Sangha, there will be a week-long retreat and Great Vow and Bright Way are all doing week-long retreats. And it's a celebration of Shakyamuni sitting under the Bodhi tree and having his moment of awakening. And that moment came after he had spent years doing deep ascetic practice of denying his body, of thinking he had to undertake austere practices in order to understand reality, in order to understand why things happen in the world the way they did, to understand why bad things happen to good people, why there's suffering, why there's pain. And after years of practice, his, all of his teachers said, you know what, you've learned everything we have to teach. And he said, but my questions aren't answered. There's still more, my questions aren't answered. So he sat down with the resolve saying, I'm going to sit here until I realize my answer. And as he sat, a woman came by and offered him rice porridge or rice milk, a, a bowl of sustenance, a bowl of nourishment. She, some stories say she had mistaken him for a tree spirit and made this offering. Um, but he accepted it and he took nourishment. And with that, he did have his moment of awakening. He did have his moment of realization. He did have his moment of seeing through delusion. And reflecting on that meal that he took, that influenced what he would later teach as a middle way between um, denying and cutting off or reifying and insisting that uh, things are a particular way. There's a, there's a lot of philosophy around that and I'm simplifying things greatly. Um, I'll just say that. So that sense of delusion, that sense of um, we don't see clearly is part of what is being pointed to when we look at something like right thinking and when we look at something called right intention however we name this second of the of the uh, noble eightfold path that there's a part of how our mind works is to mistake things or to have habits of thought or habits of mind that lead towards uh, misinterpretation. And this is natural. This is part of survival as a human being, right? There's a classic example in Buddhist philosophy about 
uh, mistaking a rope for a snake. So, oh, I can't, I can't remember all of the, the parts of the logic that goes through this, but it has to do with, with seeing a rope in the dark and mistaking it for a snake. But we do this, right? I've done this. I'm sure you guys have done this. You get up in the night, heading towards the bathroom in the dark, and you see a shadow, and all of a sudden there's a startle response. Um, we see something differently than we had assumed it to be. And there's a sense of shock and awake. And what is that? And there's a way in which this learning to see can also be applied to ourselves. There is often the sense that we know who we are right? Can you nod your head if you think you know who you are? Okay, I got a shrug. I got a maybe. Okay, this is a good group. These are serious practitioners here. You know what's going on. We think we know who we are. We got a very adamant head shaking there from Dixie. Um, I'll let me rephrase that then. Some of us think we know who we are. And part of my day today was spent um, giving and receiving critique and feedback with my peers in the chaplaincy training group that I'm in. And there is something very tender and also very mm, transformative in seeing and hearing how other people perceive you seeing or hearing other people remark on your behavior patterns or the ways in which you engage the world or how you show up and support others. Because we don't always see ourselves clearly. There's a, you know, it makes me think of professional card players who when they play each other, they start looking for those tells like those little tiny things like, you know, when, when Joe's got a good hand, he, he taps his finger on the table. You start to pick up on these little things. They don't know they're doing it. Part of their job is to identify their tells and get rid of them so they can be as neutral as possible. But we all do this. And we all have hidden parts of ourselves that we don't know about. So we learn. This is one of the uh, gifts of Sangha, of training together and being with each other. And for those of you who have done long retreats, you know, there's something very sweet about sitting next to someone for a week, having a sense of who they are, and maybe not even knowing their name. There's that intimacy that can develop. And I realize I've digressed far, far away from right thought, but it's related in a way. It's related in a way. It circles back to that importance of clarity. This is one of our core values as well. Are you sure? What am I doing? Hello, habit energy. And bodhicitta. And this aspect of bodhicitta is also what Bhikkhu Bodhi was pointing to at the end of that paragraph, um, where he says, thus a penetrating view of the nature of existence gained through a deep reflection and validated through investigation brings with it a restructuring of values which sets the mind moving towards goals commensurate, commensurate with the new vision. We have a vision of wholeness. We have a vision of wholesomeness. We have a vision of who we want to be, how we want to show up in the world. And we move ourselves towards that, not in a deliberate way, but by refining 
our habits of mind. And by practicing with this right thinking or right intention. And at some point, bodhicitta naturally arises, this wish for the benefit of all. And it's a step on the path. And it's a step on the path that we have to take. Only I can work with my mind. Only you can work with your mind. But we can help each other see who we are through practicing together, through reflection, through honest critique and feedback as well. So we learn to heal our bad habits and cultivate good habits and to show up and be clear. So that's what I have for my talk for today. And so comments and questions and critiques and feedback and all that stuff is welcome. In a way, one thing I thought while you said that, comparing the two and all that was right view is where you're headed and right thinking is how you get there. Yeah, and they're all interconnected. And Bhikkhu Bodhi pointed out that they're interconnected. And as we get into more of the, the um, parts of the Noble Eightfold Path, we'll see how they're also interconnected. I'm so happy to be in a Zoom meeting and saying words like bodhicitta and not having to translate it for a bunch of non-Buddhists. So what does it mean? Bodhicitta? Yeah. Um, It is the, it's funny, different, different groups are going to define it differently. Uh, when I was in graduate school, the Buddhists I studied with there would define bodhicitta as um, the wish to gain enlightenment as fast as possible to be of benefit for others. And in the Zen tradition, we tend to think of it a little bit differently and we tend to refer to it more as um, sort of that awakening wish to to benefit or the awakening wish to practice sometimes it's at the root of way seeking mind but it's that it's that part that turns towards practice as um, an aspiration not just for ourselves but for the benefit of others as well Shintai, do you want to add anything to that definition? Not really. What came to mind was it's the, what I recall about that is it's the mind that seeks the way is the heart, the heart of bodhicitta. Yeah. I had a lesson this week in the phenomenon that my right view is most likely the wrong view uh, in, terms, in terms of perception. Um, I, I perceived that someone with whom I have a relationship was not happy or dissatisfied. And I did harm in that I acted on that perception in a very erroneous way. Hmm. Um, and my intention was good. <laughs> my intention was to relieve suffering 
but because of my wrong view, I caused suffering. Hmm. Uh, so for me, and I, I'm speaking this in terms of perception as view, um, for me, it's very good if I think I'm perceiving something to just stop and <laughs> get some kind of verification or get a little clearer about what's actually going on um, rather than just moving forward. Uh, yeah. And then perhaps right action comes in. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Or maybe we need another, another, uh, another aspect of right communication. Mm -hmm. Right. Checking in with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually covered that in a book on empaths that I read on asking human questions, mm. <laughs> asking what I want to ask, are you okay? Instead of just assuming that I know your emotions, I feel you, as mm -hmm. you said, communication. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I'm good at it. <laughs> yeah. How'd that, how'd that, uh, How'd that situation resolve it? Did well, it it did resolve itself. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and part of it is what Nancy was talking about in the beginning that that um, we have a situation where our our living situation is changing dramatically, mm -hmm. um, and um, so it it ended up that everyone at the moment anyway, thinks they've made the right decision. <laughs> um, um, but ultimately there was nothing any of us could have done to prevent it working out the way it did. I mean, that's the way people were moving. And um, so here we are. Yeah. 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 And, and from the, what I noticed was that the person who suffered the most was me. <laughs> so the the um, self protection, the personal protective equipment, <laughs> um, it, it came into. I understood that perfectly. I, mm -hmm. I wasn't using it in that way, um, but I could have saved myself a lot of suffering if I had. Mm -hmm. Josh, and I have a question for you. Um, certainly. So I'm not sure if I heard this. I'm not sure if I heard this connection, and I, I'm curious about it. Um, I think you said something um, about making this connection between like right thought or right intention and the path of transformation. Mm -hmm. um, did I did I hear that in there someplace? I was just wondering um, about about your connection between the, those two. A little bit more. Yeah, I think I, I think I slid over into that little bit about changing the past. Um, and I think, and I think the connecting point is that gaining clarity about our habits of thought, mm. and gaining clarity about our own habits of the stories that we tell ourselves. And what happens when we change the words we use when we tell those stories to ourselves? Mm -hmm. And so, um, an example from from uh, my experience is working with you know childhood hurts, and once I once. I knew not on a cognitive level, but on an emotional level, why certain things happened. I could feel compassion for family members. And then that changed the story I told myself about how I grew up. So that narrative around particular hurts dissolved. And in a way it was a, a healing aspect, but it also 
It changed the past in the way that when I tell my story of my past, I tell it a different way now. If that makes sense. But there's a there was an understanding and a release and a, a change in narrative. And it's that narrative, it's that that pattern of stories we tell ourselves about who we are that makes up our current understanding of who we are. That's helpful. I, um, I'm so fascinated and intrigued by this path that we're all on and the, the, and transformation. Right. And I feel like that's one of those things that you can kind of hold up. Like you were talking about early, like there's so many, there's so many different facets to how we transform. So, um, and, and what supports transformation. I, I just, I, I, I'm kind of always holding that question about like how, like I've experienced that, but can I, can I articulate how that even happened? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's so unique and yet there for each person and yet there are common elements. So it's helpful to hear you talk about like that is an important aspect of, of transformation of how, how we um, work with and actually transform the past in a certain way yeah. yeah and buddhism is full of so many different tools to use on this path of transformation and what works for one person might not work for another and it doesn't mean you have to contort yourself to do what somebody else does it's just try a different tool find one that works and uh, I have a lot of faith in it. I'm relieved to hear you say changing the language of the story changed your view rather than saying stop telling stories. <laughs> no, I don't think we can stop telling stories. I, I've i always heard it the other way and I, I like your way better. <laughs> Sometimes I'll say, um, you know, the mind secretes thoughts the way the tear ducts secrete tears. This is, this is what happens. And being aware of what happens in the mind is important. And being attentive to what happens in the mind is just as important to being attentive to what happens to the body, right? We're attentive to what we feed our body. We can be attentive to what we feed ourselves and our minds. Right. So Joshin, in your example, mm -hmm. was it through sitting and trying to use these different tools or actually uh, having some conversations with whatever stories, whoever or whatever circumstance made the story? Um, I think it was just a lot, a lot of sitting and I was at a particular place in my practice where I was working a lot with childhood memories. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a, oh, all of a sudden everything's better. It was days of just sitting in the Zendo crying as, you know, old hurts got worked through. Um, and it was, you know, real, realizing that the narrative shifted came after. But there was definitely a process of, of um, working through that, all stuff. Yeah, that's really really good. So is part of that process um, would you describe as grief of grieving it, grieving was it going through that kind of a process? Yeah, I think there was a grief process, but I think it was. Um, Grieving, grieving a life I had wished for as a child and it never manifested. And so grieving that, that, that loss of an old dream, um, which is something that I wasn't even aware of when I was that young.
Mm -hmm. We got time for probably another one. Well, another one. I'm not quite sure how it fits, but um, as I was trying to capture a note on it, but you made a statement about um, looking at the good intentions or the intentions. And it helps understand like why bad things happen to good people and, uh, and other things that you listed. But I've always been, um, I read the book that's called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious if you maybe could talk about that a little more, what you meant with that. Mm. What else was I talking about at that point? Let me see. <laughs> I think it's just about, Delusions around the nature of reality. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, and then why bad things happen. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I remember now. I think, I think what I was getting at that point was just a sense of, I've met so many people in the hospital who will say, I did everything right. I did everything right. Why is, why am I sick like this? Like I took care of myself. I ate the right things. Why am I sick like this? And there's a, an inability to accept things as they are, which is also a delusion. There's a, a fixation on it should be different. I checked all the boxes. It should be different. And so I think there's an important part in recognizing when we are doing that, when we are um, holding on to this idea of, I did all these things, why am I not getting the right consequence? Why am I not getting the right outcome? When there is so much that influences how a moment arises, it's not just our soul actions that influence that. There's so much other stuff that happens. Yeah. And I haven't read that book that you referenced. So um, I don't know if I have much to say on that point. I haven't read it so long ago. I don't really remember. I just cut, it was a catchy, it was a good title. And yeah. It had some points like you just made. There's so many other factors that you can't even really know what it was well, how they all could come together because you only have one part of it. Yeah. It was very easy for people to worry about what ifs and um, or things that they have no control over or no influence on. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, please make a show. The universe is the boundless sky, just as the lotus is not wetted by the water that surrounds it, the mind is immaculate and beyond the dust. Let us bow to the highest Lord, all Buddhas throughout space and time, all honored ones, bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, wisdom beyond wisdom, maha prajna paramita. Thank you all. Please feel free to unmute yourself and 